This is the family history of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. Well, the title of the message tonight is Just in Time. Just in Time. The fourth chapter of the little book of Ruth divides into three sections. This past Sunday morning, we, uh, we covered the first two sections. We talked about Ruth landing a husband. And uh, we learned a, a spiritual lesson there. And the spiritual lesson that we were taught was this, that redemption, being bought back out of slavery, being bought back to God, redemption uh, is available. And then we learned, a se- the, 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 uh, the second portion was that Ruth loves her home. There's a lesson behind that as well, and that is that disillusionment is curable. We found there a a lady named Naomi, a lady who was a believer in the Lord God of Israel, but had experienced disillusionment after disillusionment in her life. She had lost her husband, and then she had lost her two sons, and uh, she came back to Bethlehem destitute and poor. And yet we realize that God begins to change her heart here, And that the disillusionment that has gripped her and drawn her so so down uh, is beginning to to release itself upon her. Well, tonight I want us to look at the final few verses of the book of Ruth. And that is that Ruth leaves a heritage. Verses 18 through 22. When we talk about a heritage, we're talking about the sum total of everything that you and I leave behind. It is our legacy, our heritage. And uh, we read just a moment ago... Uh, Katie read for us the, uh, those final few verses that give us the genealogy of, uh, of Ruth and of Ruth's descendants and her ancestors. And so the little book of Ruth is a story placed into the Bible to show us uh, how King David uh, is, uh, how, how uh, Boaz is in the line of King David who was of the throne of Israel. And it is very, very important because it is through the line of Boaz and later David and uh, Jesse, his father, that the Lord Jesus is born. Well, what does Ruth leave behind as far as a heritage goes? I would say, first of all, that Ruth's memory lives forever in the pages of God's Word. There are only two books in the Bible that bear the name of a woman, and uh, Ruth is one of those. The other is, we wouldn't want to take the book of Esther. And so Esther uh, begins with a... uh, Esther begins with a feast and ends with a funeral, and the book of Ruth uh, is just the opposite. And so her memory lives forever in the pages of God's Word. There are only 66 of these books that comprise the Word of God, and one of those bears the name of Ruth. The second thing I would say is this. Her soul now lives forever through the mercy of God's Son. The Bible teaches us that this life is not the end, that when we die that there is a life after. There are one of two places that every soul goes, either to heaven or to hell. And so the Bible tells us that Ruth's soul lives forever through the mercy of God's Son. In fact, if you have your Bible, and in fact, you do have a Bible there in the pew in front of you, you might want to look back to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Matthew writes in the first century, he was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, And he writes to a mostly Jewish audience. Now, if you were a Jew, genealogy was very important to you. And so Matthew writes to the Jews in the first century to tell them, to explain to them that Jesus of Nazareth came from as a descendant of David. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, he tells us that Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. Aram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. And Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered King David. And so the list 
the, the same list in Matthew as we have in the end of Ruth actually includes the names of three women. That's really quite unusual in Jewish genealogies. Who are those three women? Did you notice who they were? First of all, all there was Tamar. Tamar uh, committed adultery with her father-in-law, Judah, fathering twin boys, Perez and Zerah. Why in the world would God include the name of a woman like that in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the answer to that, I believe, is this. The lesson is that God saves sinners. God saves people who make horrible moral decisions and choices. God saves them, He forgives them, and He brings them into His family as He did with Tamar. The second woman whose name is mentioned is that of Rahab. Now Rahab, it says uh, in verse 5, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho as Joshua and his armies invaded. Uh, she hid his spies on a roof. She confessed faith in the Lord God of Israel. And what is the lesson here? Why would God include a prostitute in a list of people who are in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Well, it is that here's the lesson. God saves sinners who repent. Because here was a woman who had heard. She said, I've heard about this Lord God of Israel. She says this to the spies. I've heard about your God about how he has destroyed army after army after army. And in my heart, I know that he is the only true God, and I fear him, and I worship him. And so she confesses her faith in God. She wants to turn from her way of moral debauchery and wants to live a life of, of moral purity. And so God saves sinners who repent. Could I just tell you that is true today? God saves sinners. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter how deeply you've sunk. God can save you and forgive you if you will repent of your sin. Now to repent means not, uh, to repent of our sins means to grieve for our sins. To realize that what we've done is an offense to a holy God and to be willing to turn from our sins and trust in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Rahab is a, 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 an example of this. God saves sinners who repent. You may be here tonight and you would say, David, I'm ready to do that. I am ready to repent of my sins and give my life to Christ. Well, you have come at just the right time. You have come to the right place at the right time tonight. But the third woman who's mentioned in this list is the woman of Ruth. And Ruth is a young Moabite woman who marries a Jewish boy who moved in down the street there in Moab. He dies. And she decides to go back with her mother-in-law to their hometown of Bethlehem. She confesses faith in the Lord God of Israel, but there's a problem. The problem is that she is from Moab, and the Old Testament states that no Moabite person shall be allowed to even enter into the tabernacle of God and worship the Lord God of Israel up until the 10th generation. And so she is under a curse, if you please, from God's law. Well, she comes back to Bethlehem, uh, along with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And there in Bethlehem, she meets an eligible, wealthy bachelor named Boaz. They fall in love and they marry. And since she takes Boaz's name, she's now a member of his family. And so she is, in essence, adopted into a new family. Boaz becomes what the Bible calls her kinsman redeemer. And the curse of the law is lifted off of her. Ruth is now a full-fledged, child of God. What's the lesson God gives us there? The lesson from chapter 4 is that God saves sinners who trust in a Redeemer. Well, because 1,300 years later, God would send another little baby boy into the world, born of a virgin, laid in a manger by his mother Mary and stepfather Joseph. And that little baby would be God's very own son, the Redeemer of all who would receive him into their hearts and lives through repentance and faith in Christ. And it is because of the sacrifice of that baby, grown to be a man, that the soul of this woman Ruth still lives today. Ruth is alive and with God now in the presence of the Lord and his angels. And so here's the third lesson that we learn out of this chapter. And that is that immortality is attainable. Immortality is attainable. 
In September, Terry Schaefer was strolling the streets of Moline, Illinois. She knew exactly what she was looking for, a gift for her husband, David, for Christmas. But she realized that it might be a little bit too expensive. And so a little shop on Fifth Avenue attracted her attention. She went inside, she looked over in the corner, and she saw exactly the gift that she wanted. That's it, she said to herself. And then she turned to the shopkeeper and asked, so how much is it? He said, only $127.50. Well, her smile faded into disappointment because she realized that David's salary, her husband's salary, couldn't stand a jolt like that. He was feeding and clothing the family uh, on a policeman's wage, and so it was out of the question. Yet she hated to give up without a try, so she applied a little uh, womanly persistence. She uh, said, well, how about putting this aside for me? Maybe I could pay you a little each week and then come and pick it up a few days before Christmas. Absolutely not, said the shopkeeper. I won't do that. And then he smiled and he said, but I tell you what I will do. I'll wrap it up for you right now and you can take it with you. You can pay me later. Terry was elated. They worked out an agreement that she would pay him so much every week. And then she thanked and thanked and thanked the man as she left, explaining how delighted her husband would be. Oh, that's nothing at all, said the shopkeeper, not realizing how critically and how significant uh, his generosity would play in the days ahead. Well, then came Saturday, October the 1st. Patrolman David Schaefer, Terry's husband, was working the night shift, and he got a call in his squad car. A drugstore robbery was in progress. And so David reacted instantly. He arrived at the scene just in time to see the suspect speed away in a car. So with his sirens screaming and lights flashing, he followed in hot pursuit. Three blocks later, the getaway vehicle suddenly pulled over, stopped, and uh, the driver did not move. So David carefully approached the suspect with his weapon drawn. Two things, when he was only three feet from the door, two things happened immediately, uh, just right in a row. The door flew open, and the thief produced a 45 caliber uh, automatic weapon and fired at right point blank range at David's abdomen. At 7 o'clock that morning, a patrolman came to the Schaefer home. And calmly and with great care, he told Terry what had happened. Her husband had been pursuing a robbery, a robbery suspect. There had been gunfire. David had been hit. He had been shot at point-blank range, stunned. Terry thought how glad she was that she had not waited until Christmas to give the present to her husband. She was how grateful she was that the shopkeeper had been willing to let her pay for it over time. Otherwise, otherwise David would have surely died. But instead, he was now in the hospital, not with a gunshot wound, but with a very, very bad bruise in his abdomen. Because you see, what happened was that David was wearing the gift of life that Terry could not wait to give, the gift that she gave him just in time, the gift of his very own new bulletproof vest. Amen. You may be here tonight and you are not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what's kept you from faith in Christ. I don't know what's kept you from commitment and surrender to Jesus. But could I just say this? If this evening you find yourself a sinner, if you find yourself to be a person who would say to God, Lord, I confess to you with all of my heart that I have fallen short of your expectations, that I have broken your laws and your commandments, if you are a sinner, and if you are a sinner who is willing to repent of your sin, If you are ready tonight to say to God, Lord, I'm I'm tired of living life my way. With me as master, with me as Lord, with me as the boss. And Jesus, I want you to be the master and Lord of my life. Jesus, I believe you died on a cross to pay for my sins. That you took my sins upon yourself and in my place. I believe you died to pay for my sins. And I believe you rose again, Lord Jesus. I am willing to give my life to you. If you could say tonight, Lord, 
I am ready to take you as my redeemer, as my kinsman redeemer. Lord, I want to be adopted into the family of God. I want to be one of your children. And let me say to you, you can leave tonight. You can leave tonight safe in the arms of God. You have come to God tonight just in the nick of time because God has brought you to this place by His sovereign hand drawn you here tonight. And if His Spirit has opened your heart to believe and repent of sin, this is the moment for you. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I pray for someone tonight. Someone tonight who, for whatever reason, has never given their heart and life to Christ. And yet, God, you have changed them. You have turned them. You have opened their hearts and minds to know now that you love them, that you care for them, that your son died for them and rose again. And so now I pray that from the bottom of their hearts that they would yield to Christ, that they would cry out unto you in the words of Jesus saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, as the man in the temple did. Oh God, would you have mercy upon them now? And because of faith in Jesus Christ, would you make them your redeemed child, your son, your daughter, adopted into the family of God, that they might walk out of here tonight belonging to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.